Last week, Alicia and I had the pleasure of being with the Fair Valley Church and Fair Valley Bible Institute on their annual lectureship program. And the theme of the lectureship, How I Know There Is a God. And it was a lectureship that was based on Christian evidences. I was assigned a topic, uh, two topics, but one of them was for a class period. And the title of that particular uh, class period was Ministering to Those in Doubt. And the study was, for me personally, very enriching because I understand that there are a lot of people in our world who doubt the validity of, of the Bible. They are skeptical about the existence of God. And even those who do believe there is a God and perhaps even profess the name of Christ sometimes go through trials and they wonder, where is God in the midst of my trial. Now, doubt is something that can be overcome. And when we minister to those who doubt, that's what we want to do, help them overcome it. It is, it is our nature as human beings to be uh, curious. Uh, we want to find out those things that we don't know. But the good news is this, the things that pertain to man's salvation can be known. We can understand what God expects of us while we live here on earth because those things have been revealed. And yet I also realize as long as we're in this world and we have all of these various isms, atheism, skepticism, modernism, denominationalism, liberalism, radicalism, there will always be doubt because those isms breed such. And therefore we have to confront them. Societal woes, personal conflicts, cause many people to question the purpose or the meaning of life. And some even ponder if life is worth living. About 20 years ago, I remember that I received the tragic news that, a, that the son of a longtime friend had been killed in an automobile accident. And when I heard this news, I said to Celicia, I want you to go with me. We've got to go and be with my friend. And I want to attend the funeral. And so we left and went to my home area of Alabama to be a part of that funeral service and to uh, embrace my sweet friend who I had known since childhood and who was a faithful member of the church. She was the mother of this boy who died. I remember sitting beside another lady at the funeral service. I knew this lady from my childhood. She was a faithful Christian woman. And as we're seated next to each other before the service began and quietly talking, this lady said to me, she says, I'm very concerned about the mother of this boy who died. She said, I hear her saying things that a Christian just ought not to say. She's She's talking about how, how uh, God could let this happen and she doesn't know if she can continue being faithful to God because of what she's experienced. And why would, why would God allow this happen to me? Well, I can tell you 20 years later, the mother of that boy is a faithful Christian woman. But what my friend seated next to me didn't understand was this, that she was, this, this woman was going through an emotionally distraught time. My friend seated next to me, just like I had never experienced anything like that. And not having been in that situation, we don't know really how we might respond at the time. Because all of us go through those moments when emotionally we're somewhat unstable. And certainly somebody who loses a child is going to go through that particular period of time. And that's when we turn to Jesus, right? Jesus had the most balanced mind of anybody who ever lived. We can understand why. Because he was more than a man. He was God in the flesh. And yet Paul still says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.5 We have an obligation while we're here on this earth to study the mind of Christ. What a privilege to have a mind like Jesus. 
I really do believe in Philippians 4, 8, we have the mind of Christ exposed for us. Whatsoever things are true and honest and just. You've read that list, all those beautiful qualities. That is the mind of Christ. And as ministering servants of Christ, our responsibility is to learn from Him. He was the greatest preacher, the greatest teacher, greatest counselor, greatest psychologist that has ever lived. And here's what he said of himself, or what the scriptures say concerning Jesus. He needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man, John 2, 25. Therefore, our Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. And so we learn from studying him and watching how he ministered to other people. Now, the good news for those of us who are Christians is this. Those of us who've been baptized to Christ have had our sins washed away. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. And 1 Peter 5, 7 gives us this assurance. We cast all of our burdens upon Him. He cares for us. So we have knowledge of something the rest of the world doesn't understand. And we've taken advantage of something that He grants to us. He gives us something very, very special. He gives us new life. And then on top of that, he says, bring your burdens to me. And once you do that, having been enlightened by the Savior's love and care, he says you can turn your attention outward and help somebody else. That's what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. When we read that God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of mercies is the God of all comfort. Now listen to what he continues to say. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort with, wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now think about that just for a moment. We've taken our burdens and our trials to the Lord. We know him. We know his invitation that's been extended. Bring your burdens to me. I'll take care of them. Now you can go and minister to those who don't understand that. Who, at least to this point in life, don't, don't have that kind of access to the throne of God. Go to them. Minister to them. And present Christ to them. Those who are in our society, who are all around us, who need help, we point them to God. And there are many people in our society who are filled with dread, who are filled with desperation, who regularly doubt. And so, while we have to continually remind ourselves that we belong to God, He's the source of our strength, our burden bearer, we need to acknowledge such so that we can in turn help others. Now, how does God use his ministering servants? I want you to think about this just for a moment. Within each one of us, God can use us to minister to others, and he will do that by utilizing our talents. He will do that by utilizing our experiences, by taking our unique personalities and allowing those unique personalities to reach out to other people. He will use us through the wisdom that we have attained, through our enthusiasm. He will utilize us through our trustworthiness and through our spirituality. All these are ways that God can use each one of us personally as we minister to other people. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ came in contact all of the time with people who were filled with doubt. And Matthew 9, 36 is one example of that where Jesus looked upon the masses of people and when he looked upon the masses of people, he couldn't believe what he saw. And what he saw was this, a group of people who were shepherdless, a group of people who were sin sick and hurting and wandering around without a shepherd and he wanted to be their shepherd. So Jesus understands that there are people who are filled with doubt, people who are seeking in need of a Savior, and he says we are the ones who can help them come to the understanding that there is a Savior and restore hope to them. I remember that uh, uh, the, the movie, been several movies uh, and theatrical productions 
uh, entitled Showtime, show, show, Showboat, <laughs> Showboat. And Showboat, uh, one of my favorites is with uh, uh, Catherine Grayson and Howard Keel. Both have tremendous voices. But if you ever watch that particular version of the movie Showboat, the best song of all is sung by that uh, baritone, William Warfield, when he sings Old Man River. Old Man River has a special place in our hearts, doesn't it? Because we live here right beside the mighty Mississippi, and that's Old Man River. And in that song, remember, Warfield would sing these words. He says, I'm tired of living, but I'm scared of dying. And a lot of people, that's, that's how they go through their lives. Tired, weary. Tired of living, but, but scared of dying. And, and I really do believe that's the audience that Jesus was talking about uh, or that the scriptures talk about when we read Matthew 9, 36 and, content, and consider Jesus looking out there at, at the masses of people. They were a people who were tired of living, but scared of dying. But some of those closest to Jesus had doubt, didn't they? John the Baptist, he's the one who announced the coming of Messiah. Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But Jesus had something good to say about John the Baptist, didn't he? Of those born of women, none any greater than John the Baptist. And yet we know this about John while he was in prison. He asked this question to two of Jesus' disciples. So go, and, go and say to Jesus, I ask him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? What, what's the problem? Doubt. What about the passage I quoted this morning from John 14? Remember Philip who said, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. And Jesus was right there, the very embodiment of the Father. And, and Philip was suffering from something called doubt. It was Pilate, the Roman governor, who was so cynical about truth. And remember, he asked Jesus, are you a king? And Jesus said, Well, thou sayest that I am a king, and to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And then Pilate says, What is truth? Pilate was a doubter. But there is a disciple of Jesus who, whose name is equivalent to a doubter. You know that disciple. His name is Thomas, a rather gloomy figure, one who was always seemingly filled with dread and, and with despair. You remember that Thomas was filled with dread on one occasion. Jesus and the disciples were to return to Judea. Jesus was going to do something magnificent. He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But on this occasion, as recorded in John 11, the disciples are going to go with Jesus, but they don't know that Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. In fact, what they know is this. The last time they were in the region of Judea, uh, they almost were killed. And things didn't look good upon their return to Judea again. But Jesus says, let's go to Lazarus. And it was Thomas who said, well, let's go then. If that's what you're, if that's what you're planning to do, let's go. And let's die with him. What's Thomas saying? I don't believe we'll survive down there in Judea. I don't believe we'll We'll, we'll make it. We get down there, they're going to kill us. So Lazarus is dead and we're going to die also. And then in the upper room, Jesus spoke about leaving his disciples. It's Thomas again who says, Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way? Remember, Jesus has been talking about heaven, that passage we studied this morning. And how, how can we know the way? If you're going to leave us behind, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's Jesus' response. He loves Thomas, but he understands that Thomas is, is, is suffering desperately because he's filled with doubt. And then Jesus goes to the cross and he dies and is raised again from the dead. And again, we see the gloomy Thomas who's not present when the Lord makes his appearance to his disciples. 
Remember, it was the first day of the week. They were assembled together. Thomas, for whatever reason, was not there. They told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But here's gloomy, doubting Thomas. Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe, John 20, 25. Now surely Jesus is going to come down hard on Thomas, isn't he? No, he doesn't. Next week, Thomas is present. And here's the answer to doubt. Jesus says, look at me. You can see by the nail print in the hands. And you can see the, the print of, of my side, the scar. You can know that it is I. He said, my Lord and my God. What did Thomas need to see to remove all doubt? The evidence, didn't he? He just needed to see the evidence. And when he saw the evidence, he said, My Lord and my God. One may doubt because he's an agnostic, just not sure there's a God. And then there's the one who could have a saving knowledge of the Word of God, but still from time to time go through life's difficulties and because of these experiences in life, have some doubt. But whether or not a person is, is an agnostic or just a child of God who has become disillusioned, it is imperative that those of us who have a steadfast faith keep Christ ever before such individuals. Because you see, I notice when I study the scriptures, our Lord loves the doubter just like he loves everybody else. And he wants to bring the one who's doubting into a saving knowledge of him. As with Thomas, Jesus still allows people today to examine the evidence. He doesn't try to hide it from anybody. And so as we continue in our message, I want us to think just a moment about how we can minister first to ourselves when we doubt, but also how we can minister to those who doubt. One thing we must do is follow this principle. When anybody doubts, they need to have their faith reaffirmed in the Word of God. And we're reminded of great passages that speak of this. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Or Hebrews 4, 12, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharpening a two-edged sword. To those who doubt reaffirm faith in the Word of God. Now, once we establish that, here's the second thing. And it comes from our reaffirmation of faith in the Word of God. It is reassurance that God cares. Casting all your care upon Him, He careth for you. You believe that, don't you? Then you have to help somebody else believe that as well. Once we've reaffirmed our faith in the Word of God, we've got to be reassured that God cares. Then number three, add to that a realization that Christ lives. 1 Thessalonians 4.18, remember at the conclusion of Paul's uh, words concerning the second coming of Jesus and the glorious resurrection, wherefore comfort one another with these words that Jesus did not stay in the ground but triumphantly arose from the dead. And so in ministering to those in doubt, they need reaffirmation of the Word of God, which will lead to a reassurance that God cares and then to a realization that Christ lives. Anybody who doubts needs to understand this. They need to recognize that the doubter is loved. Thomas was loved by Christ. Regardless of the fact that he missed that first opportunity to see Jesus, Jesus wanted to see him, and a week later he did see him, and he allowed him to examine that evidence. It doesn't make any difference whatsoever when a person is in pain and in anguish and, and tempted to doubt God's care and concern, God still loves that person, doesn't he? I love the story of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans when they lost a child, and their reaction. 
I don't in any way pretend to know everything about the religious background of Roy and Dale. But I do remember that they had reared several children, having adopted several. And Roy and Dale stand head and shoulders in character when you consider some that have come out of the entertainment industry. But they did have a belief in God. To what extent, I don't really know. But I, I do know that this particular story touched me. Roy, as typical of many individuals, was grieving over the loss of one of those children. And he started to blame God. Why did God let this happen? And Dale got on to him. Roy, how can you say such a thing? God's been so good to us. He's blessed us with all these other children. He gave his son on the cross. We can't blame God because we lost a son. Months passed, and Roy and Dale were driving out in Southern California, and as they were going from one place to another, Roy began to talk about their blessings. And Dale said, I'm glad to hear you speaking this way because when we lost our son, remember some of the things you were saying? Remember how you were talking and blaming God for that? Roy smiled at Dale and said, yes, but God knew I didn't mean it. Right. He knew I didn't mean it. I'm so thankful there are times in our lives when God knew we didn't mean it. That's what a loving heavenly father he is. And so when in doubt, we must recognize that the doubter is loved. There also needs to be a revelation of the cause of doubt. Whatever it is that's, that's bothering somebody, uh, whatever it is that's, that's, that's causing chaos in life, what must a person do? Identify it. Until a person can identify it, he's not going to be able to, to solve the problem. And so one has to say, why, why am I suffering in this particular way? What's causing this? Because until I identify the problem, then I cannot fix it. And then once there is revelation of the cause of doubt, there must be resistance toward that which causes it. Now, there are some I know today who wander away from divine truth. And I recall that when this happened uh, to some who were graduates of our school, Brother Cates would ask this question. He would ask, what have you been reading lately? What have you been reading that has caused you to begin doubting? And that's a good question to ask. When someone begins to stray from divine truth, why? What have you been studying? You've taken your eyes off of the Lord. You've taken your eyes off of divine truth. And therefore, you've started to doubt. And then the doubter needs to see the relationship of the Christian to Jesus. How can you and I help someone who's doubting if our relationship to the Lord is not what it should be? Philippians 3.10, Paul said that his number one goal in life was this, that I may know him. Paul spent his entire life not just preaching about Jesus, but knowing him more intimately. And that's how he could convince a whole lot of people that what he had was real. And finally, number eight, when we help someone who is doubting, we want them to see the reflection of the Christian in or the reflection of the Christian to the doubter. You want to see, you want the doubter to see that you have a confidence that others do not have. And these same people can have that confidence. I, I like how the Hebrews writer states that in Hebrews 10.35 when he says, Cast not therefore away your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Now think about that. Somebody who is a confident person, you want to be around that person. Somebody who's confident is not one who's filled with doubt. Now I understand some can can have an overwhelming self-confidence, and that's not good. 
But you want to see that person who has his confidence in God. The believer in the Bible is one who has confidence in God. That's what we want to believe. We know what God says, and as a result of that, we are following Him through obedience, and as a result of that, we have, we have confidence. And when others can see that confidence, it will help them. It will help them to overcome. And so you may be here this afternoon, you have some doubt. Though you are a believer in Christ and you are a child of God, sometimes you doubt his nearness. Think about these things we've talked about. And remember that, that as a Christian, you have the privilege of, of taking your burdens to the Lord. I have that privilege as well. And, and, and once we can do that, then we can help other people. I want to say this to you, the child of God. There's something that you need to leave at home tomorrow morning before you leave the house. Leave your burdens and leave your doubts. You can do that by continuing in prayer, by remembering that when you pray, you're casting all your cares upon him. And you say, I've left this burden with the Lord. Now I can go out and help somebody else, somebody who doesn't have a burden bearer. This afternoon, I pray that if you need to respond to heaven's invitation, you will. Because it could be as a child of God, you simply need our prayers and our encouragement and we extend that invitation to you. And as always, we extend an invitation to the one who's outside of Christ to come to a saving knowledge of the will of God through Jesus. Through a penitent faith, confession of sin, and through or confession in Jesus, having repented of sin, you can be baptized and your sins will be washed away. We'd love to assist someone in doing that this afternoon. If only you'll come, as together we stand and sing.